Now, armed with these three, two concepts, two concepts, we are prepared to prove what is modestly called the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics, okay? which is that competitive markets maximize, competition maximizes social welfare. This is the fundamental theorem that drives microeconomics. Okay? The competition maximizes social welfare. Okay? Well, what is social welfare? I haven't defined that yet. Well, social welfare, we're just going to say, is the sum of producer surplus plus consumer surplus. Okay? Social welfare, the welfare of society, is the surplus earned by producers plus the surplus earned by consumers. Now, you might, have, you might say this is a silly measure. If you're Bernie Sanders, you might say, I don't care about this. Okay? If you're someone else on the, on the Republican side, you might say, I don't care about that. Whatever. Okay, the bottom line is, that's how it's defined for now. And we're going to come back later to different weights on these two different parts. But for now, we're just going to add them up. This is the size of the pie. We're making the pie as big as possible. We are trying to maximize the entire size of the pie, which is what consumers get in surplus and producers get in surplus. And what we're going to show you now is that the competitive market makes that as big as possible. OK? Let's look at figure 13.6 to show you. OK? Figure 13.6 has supply and demand curve. We learned way back in the first lecture that the competitive outcomes were supply equals demand. If there's no, mar if no interference in the market, you can get the competitive outcome where supply equals demand. That will be a Q1 units per year at a price of P1. OK? So that's the competitive outcome. What I hope you will see is that that outcome is also the outcome that maximizes the sum of those two triangles, which are consumer surplus and producer surplus. OK? And to see that, let's do a simple example. <laughs> Imagine that the government mandated a price ceiling at P2. Imagine the government mandated a price ceiling at P2. So it mandated that firms could not charge more than P2. Well, we know from the second lecture in this course that that means that firms are going to go down their supply curve and only produce Q2 units at a price of P2. So the market will produce Q2 units at a price of P2. That's what we've done so far. That's the positive analysis. Now let's do the normative analysis. What does that do to the well-being of society? Well, what does that do to consumer surplus? Consumer surplus used to be um, R plus V. Used to be R plus V, right? What is consumer surplus now? Someone raise their hand and tell me by these letters. What is consumer surplus now? Someone raise, someone raise their hand and tell me. Yeah. R plus, S. R plus S. Because it's the amount above the price line, below the demand curve, up to the quantity that's sold. Okay? Q2 units are sold at a price of P2. So Q2 consumers are each getting a surplus. And that surplus is that dark shaded area, R plus S. So what we've done is we've subtracted V and we've added S. It's gone up. S is bigger than V. Consumers are better off. That was the whole idea of the policy. right? We've capped the price, so consumers are better off. What's happened to producer surplus? Producer surplus used to be S plus U plus T. What, someone raise their hand and tell me, what is producer surplus now? Raise your hand, someone raise their hand and tell me. What is producer surplus now? Once again, if you know the answer, raise your hand and tell me. Don't whisper it. Yeah. T. T. Producer surplus now is T. Okay? It is the area under the price line above the supply curve, which is T. So producers have lost S and U and are left with T. So what has happened to social welfare? Social welfare 
has gone from r plus s plus t plus u plus v to r plus s plus t. We've lost u. We've lost v. They're gone. Why are they gone? Why are u and v gone? They're gone because there were transactions that made both parties better off that aren't happening. We call this, we call this deadweight loss. We say the error u plus v is deadweight loss. Transactions that would have made both parties better off are not happening. And that is a loss to society, a net reduction in welfare from trades that are not made is the reduction in welfare from trades not made. And I sort of talked about this intuitively in the second lecture, but now we're proving it graphically, OK? Which is to show you that when there are trades that make both parties better off, as there are between Q2 and Q1, and they don't happen, then society loses. Society loses because that's just gone. V plus U is, in the, is, in the, is vapor now. It's gone. Okay? It's gone because there are Q, between Q2 and Q1 were sales that both producers and consumers were happy to have happen that have not happened. And therefore, consumer surplus, uh, total social welfare has shrunk. And this brings us back to the er earlier lectures about why things like the minimum wage in a perfectly competitive market are bad for the economy. We can see that in figure 13.7. OK. We start in a labor market with an initial equilibrium at a wage of W1 and an amount of labor at L1. Now we put in a minimum wage, which is higher than W1. Once again, if it's low in W1, it has no effect, right? It's higher than W1. That means that only L sub 2 workers are demanded. So the total amount of labor in the market falls to L sub 2. What that means is workers who used to have a, the workers are now the producers, right? That's you. You're now the producers in this case. Used to have a surplus of B plus C plus B, used to have a surplus of uh, E plus D. That used to be your surplus, E plus D. Now, it's B plus D. So you've gotten rid of the little triangle E and added the big rectangle B. Go workers. Producers used to have A plus, I'm sorry, firms, who are now consumers, used to have surplus of A plus B plus C. They now only have surplus of A. So two things have happened. The firms have transferred the rectangle B to the workers. So B is just shifted. It's still, in the, it's still in the pie. It's just who controls it in the pie. So we've shifted that, that rectangle B away from the firms to the workers. And we've lost C plus E of economic efficiency. This gives you a hint about the whole debate or trade-off about the minimum wage, which is, is transferring B to workers worth Losing C plus E. That's the whole debate right there. Okay? Is transferring B to workers from firms worth society losing the pie shrinking by the amount C plus E? Okay? So we've now given you the tools to do a welfare analysis of policy like the minimum wage. You now can talk about whether minimum wage is a good idea or a bad idea based on this kind of intuition. Okay? Questions about that?